Hey everyone and welcome to another episode of the Korean War. I am Mike B and today we're going to be talking about the subsequent events from the first video in the series. This is going to be more of the kind of lead up to what caused the Korean War in the first place. So today we're going to be talking about the Chinese Civil War and kind of what happened as a result of that. And we'll end it there to kind of keep these segments rather short so you have uh, an attention span that'll cooperate with you and me. So <clears throat> I'm just going to read off my notes a little bit. I'll try to, you know, not sit there and just read verbatim. But I took a few notes and bullet points and wrote them, wrote them down. This is a very interesting thing. And if you understand these things, the rest of the whole conflict will be easier to understand because kind of like the First World War, if you don't know what happened before 1914 in July, you won't, or June rather, because that's when it actually happened, you wouldn't understand why all those countries went to war. Same thing here. So, um... We left off last time with World War II ending and the Japanese occupation being over and all those other events in there. So if you haven't seen the first episode, you might want to start there. I might put a link in the description if I remember. Anyway, let's get started on this segment. So after World War II ended, um, the Chinese Civil War really resumed again. They weren't as busy fighting the Japanese in both Korea and Manchuria. So they resumed the fighting between the communists and the nationalists in the Chinese Civil War that had been going on before the Second World War. And it just kind of got less infighting and more, like I said, against the Japanese. So that resumed again horrifically. North Korean communists were still assisting the Chinese who weren't doing so hot in Manchuria. And the North Koreans, the North Korean communists were actually supplying them with manpower and supplies and materials and stuff like that at that time. Um, long story short, because this isn't about the Chinese Civil War per se, the Communists won in 1949. They actually beat the Nationalists and some very neat, you know, basically genocide happened after that. But again, this is about uh, the Korean War. So the, as a result of that, the People's Republic of China, now it was called the PRC, they didn't really forget the North Koreans' contribution to helping them with their victory. If you have Manchuria in China, you basically have all of the natural resources, or most of the natural resources in China. That's why the Japanese wanted it so bad in World War II and fought for it. So um, they didn't forget, and they really appreciated the assistance that North Korea gave them in Manchuria. So after um, Mao Zedong takes power, the um, People's Republic of China... Republic. Um, sorry, I'm not going to interject personal things in here, but the People's Republic of China said that Western-led nations, specifically the U.S. and U.S.-influenced countries, were the biggest threat to their national security. So that's the way they were thinking. It's kind of the whole us versus them. Now you can start to see that was happening with the Soviets and the, the Western people at that time. So it's no different in China. So China was starting to see this as their national security, a threat to their national security. And the U.S., was supporting the nationalist side during the, the Chinese Civil War and a bunch of other factors, but we'll just kind of leave it at that. So they they were rightful in their thinking and they kind of had, um, had a bad taste in their mouth for the Americans and didn't really like that. So in 1948, this is when it starts getting really amped up in the Korean Peninsula again. In 1948, North Korea had championed a massive insurgency in the southern part of the peninsula, i.e. South Korea. Um... There was an undeclared border war during this time, and it was between, you know, the ROK, the Republic of Korea, and North Korea, the um, People's Republic of Korea. Pretty sure it was the People's Republic of China. Don't quote me on that. I'm pretty sure it's the PRK. I don't know if it was the DPRK yet. So, anyway. Um, yeah, the U.S., as a result, kind of sent a few military advisors to advise the uh, um, Republic of Korean Army how to, you know, fight against the North uh, um, North Korean army. So it actually led to a successful uh, defense on the side of the uh, Republic of Korea to actually defend against the North Koreans invading, basically, the border wars, and that was kind of that. So um, this was around the 38th parallel, too, remember? Because that, that, that's the border that was agreed upon between the Soviet Union and the United States and the North Koreans and the South Koreans. Earlier on in, in the first video, I explained all that. So this is against the 38th parallel. So during that time, about 8,000 South Korean soldiers and police were killed between those border um, kind of... It, it wasn't really a, a declared war or anything, but it, there was some heavy fighting going on there. So about 8,000 South Korean soldiers and police died. 
1949 saw a few more insurgencies sporadically through South Korea. Some were led by, you know, North Korean agents. Some were just grassroots movements, defectors from the, the Republic of Korean Army, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so in August of 1949... Uh, a very serious border clash happened and then several others subsequently. And ultimately, the North Korean troops overwhelmed the South Korean, or, or Rock A, I'll call them, Rock A troops. And they ended up being completely routed. And um, that was kind of a victory that the North saw. And by early 1950, um, both the insurgencies that were happening and the border battles got very very quiet and things were rather calm so um kind of moving forward with that so you kind of see how this is building right you see these little border clashes these 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 little fights that are happening here and there but eight thousand people on one side died and that's that's the confirmed number so you kind of see where this is going so kim il-sung the new leader of north korea thought that uh between the uprisings and the border battles and all that stuff that he had weakened, that he and his forces had weakened the, the Rock A and just everybody in the South, uh, South Korea's forces to basically nothing and they were demoralized and weak. And that actually the South Korean people who weren't in the military would welcome the communists with open arms if they were to invade at this point, 1949-ish, in 1950. So, but this was mainly in 1949. So he, uh, Kim traveled to Moscow to meet with Uncle Joe, or Joe St Joseph Stalin, sorry. I keep putting these personal things in here. I just kind of want this to be factual instead of my own little twang, but I just can't help myself sometimes. It's so fun. So, yeah, he goes to Moscow and tries to persuade Stalin that now is the time. It's a good time to invade, and I, I you know, I want your support. Will you, will you do that? And at first, uh, in 1949, Stalin was kind of reluctant because, you know, things were still wrapping up. And uh, the PLA was, or the People's Liberation Army in China was still fighting the civil war against the nationalists. They were wrapping it up, but it still wasn't clear who was actually going to win. Um, U.S. forces were still in South Korea, and Stalin said, it's just, you know, Stalin wasn't that dumb. He knew that a direct war with the U.S. would be an absolute disaster for the world. So, I'm like, ah, let's, uh, let's just, uh, no, I don't really think you should do that right now, and whatever. But! In a short amount of time, by early 1950, much had changed. So the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, had won, right? Mao Zedong is in power now, right? So U.S. forces had left the Korean Peninsula. And a very important thing, the Soviets had successfully tested their first nuclear bomb, putting them at the same level, atomically, nuclear, nuclearly, as the United States. No other nation had been testing bombs at that point. So... That was a big thing that changed. So, um, Stalin after that said, uh, well, I don't think the U.S. is going to put much time and effort and thought, and, you know, resources, manpower and all that stuff into Korea. They really don't care about it, according to our agents in Moscow that are intercepting and you know, these messages that we decoded. Um, so, you know... In, in April of 1950, Stalin said, you know what, I'll give you permission to do so if you meet with Mao and you make sure that he will be sending you reinforcements if you need be, because I don't want to, I don't want to uh, have Soviet forces engaged, and I'm going to make that very clear, I don't want to have them engaged in direct ground fighting or direct combat so as to not spark a war if the U.S. invade, or um, if the U.S. starts helping South Korea. He just wanted to avoid a direct war. So, excuse me. In May of 1950, after uh, Kim met with Mao, Mao agreed to these terms and sent a bunch of the PLA veterans who were ethnic Koreans. They may have been Chinese, but they were ethnically Korean, or they were the Koreans who helped uh, the PLA win the war. Mao sent a lot of them down um, to North Korea and then moved a the, uh, couple more armies of Chinese PLA closer to the North Korean border, just in case. And the Soviets ended up sending a bunch of World War II generals, um, or generals who had served in the Second World War and had extensive combat experience, and they were sent to advise the KPA, and rightfully so, in tactics and stuff. And basically, preparations began to be made at this point, and the clock begins ticking. Tick-tock. All right. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there on this segment. 
In the next segment, we're going to go through kind of the starting lineup that either side had in June of 1950. So I hope this, I, I went over this briefly, I could go into so many more details, but we'll end up covering these indirectly and directly in the future. I just kind of wanted to get going and lay the groundwork and get some events going so we can talk about the events and then we can delve in from the macro to the micro. So we'll be starting out with early war Korean stuff and we'll go until things started changing and we'll break down the early war campaigns and all that stuff to the equipment level with uh, forces involved and all that stuff. So I just, again, wanted to get these the groundwork laid down so you kind of understand, okay, if he's talking about the P, um, the PLA, this is what he means. If he's talking about the Rock A, this is the Rock Army, stuff like that. So anyway, hopefully this video didn't go too long. Usually they're not going to be... Well, I don't want to say that because some videos might be like 30 minutes long once we get really good going on this. Anyway, you guys have been asking for me to continue this series and the Vietnam series. I'll be continuing both this winter especially. So I hope you enjoyed this. If you did enjoy this and you enjoy the rest of my content, if you consider becoming a supporter of the channel financially via Patreon or becoming a channel member, five bucks a month or more on either uh, platform or form of support, I guess. Um, gets you access to my Discord server, which is pretty fun and stuff like that. And your financial support helps me be able to fund uh, videos and stuff out of pocket, or videos and stuff that out of pocket I wouldn't be able to make, i.e. ballistic tests and things like that. This year's been great, 2020, so thanks to all my current supporters and stuff like that. Uh, it really does make a difference and allows the channel to grow and do things that I want to do but can't necessarily afford just with my own cash. If you can't do it financially, I totally get that. It's totally fine. I just appreciate you watching. Make sure you give this video a like. Subscribe if you haven't already, and share this video if you think it's interesting and that other people would enjoy this. That's a great way to support my work as well, and you don't have to pay anything for it. So, anyway, I think that's all I've got. We'll see you on the next episode of the Korean War.